Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read Luke 2 verse 51 through chapter 3 verse 6. Luke chapter 2 from 51 through chapter 3 verse 6. And we really come to the end of the uh, narrative about Jesus' birth. And of course he's 12 year old. Uh, his visit as a 12 year old to the temple and uh, we're getting into John the Baptist and uh, we'll be with John the Baptist for a while. So Luke chapter 2 verse 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. Then crooked, the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough way smooth. And all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of God. Verse 52, um, as we... Verse 51 says they went down, uh, he went down with them to Nazareth. We spoke about the fact that he was subject to them. Uh, even though he was God in the flesh, he is subject to his parents, uh, thus fulfilling the law that required honoring parents. Um, and his mother kept these things in her heart, didn't understand what was going on, um, but she kept them there, and as time went on, uh, she began to understand. Verse 52, uh, we didn't get to last week, and I want to just spend a few minutes on the, verse 52 before we speak about John. And so Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. We spoke about the fact that even though he was God in the flesh, he had willingly limited his access, if you will, to his divine authority and divine knowledge and powers. And so he is living as a man. Even though he is fully God, he is living as a man. And he doesn't have any of the prerogatives or privileges or powers uh, as God. It is there locked up. It's there within him. But he doesn't access those things. Uh, remember, we, uh, the, the best illustration I can use of this, um, and of course this is an area that we really struggle with um, because there are different views on this. Um, some people believe uh, that he did the things that he did and he lived uh, by the power of God as God, performed the miracles as God. Um, I don't accept that. I believe that Jesus does them by the Holy Spirit. Um, because if he did anything because of his divine prerogative, then he, the scripture in Hebrews would not be, fu be fulfilled in that he in all points was tempted or tested like we are. And so the point of him being a faithful high priest is that he had to live exactly the way that we live. So he is tempted, obviously without sin. Uh, he lives as a man. He is growing up as, a, uh, as an infant and as a toddler and as a young man, as a young boy and a young man later on. And he is increasing in wisdom. So he, he's not born knowing everything, but he is growing in wisdom. He is he's increasing the same way as our knowledge and our wisdom increases. Um, uh, he is increasing. And so the, the illustration then is of a man who would go to a distant tribe. Um, in the Amazon or somewhere um, and, and tell them, look, you, you can live better lives than you're living. You, you don't have to live under these terrible conditions that you're living in the, uh, in the jungle. Um, and, and yet they would look at him and say, well, you know, you just arrived here in your fancy helicopter and, uh, you know, you have all of the uh, money and all of the equipment and all the stuff and you have a fancy uh, tent that you, that you stay in or whatever, whatever he has. How do you understand how we live? 
So the only way that that man would be able to relate to those people or those people be able to relate to him would be for him to go and to live exactly as they are. So he would have to leave his helicopter behind. He would have to leave his credit card. Um, he may have his credit card in his pocket, but he could not use his credit card because if he did that, then he would not be living like they are. Now, he doesn't stop to be rich. He doesn't stop to be powerful, but he does not touch any of those prerogatives that he has as a wealthy man. And he comes and he lives in the jungle just exactly like one of those people. Then they can relate to him and he can understand them. And so he doesn't cease to be rich. He still has his credit card in his pocket or wherever he keeps his credit card. He still has access to his millions. He has access to his helicopter. He has access to his cell phone. But he doesn't touch any of those things. He just lives like an ordinary man in the jungle. And so Jesus comes and he doesn't stop being God. He doesn't have, stop having access to the divine prerogatives of, of being uh, all-knowing, of having all power. But he doesn't use those things. He doesn't access them. He lives just like a human being. Now, of course, that's difficult for us to understand. How can he have all of, of being God within him and not use those things? And yet he, he doesn't because otherwise the scripture would not be, uh, would not be fulfilled. And so uh, Jesus, and, and of course you, you see this in the, um, in the temptations uh, a, a number of times, in the temptation in the wilderness, uh, the temptation for him to perform those three miracles that the devil tempts him to change stones into bread, to jump down from the temple, and of course the other one to, uh, which is maybe not directly related to fall down and worship uh, in order to get the kingdoms. Uh, those are temptations, the first two are temptations on him to use his divine power for personal use. Could he change stones into bread? Well, as God, he could. But as a man, he could not. Unless the Father had given him the power and the, per, 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 the prerogative to do that at that particular moment. Jesus says, I do nothing except my Father tells me to do it. So if he made bre stones into bread... He would have to use his divine power and not rely on the Father to equip him to do it at that moment. Can you, you, see, the, you see the difference? And that's the temptation. The same thing, in, and I'm really going through this very quickly, uh, but uh, the same thing happens at the cross. If you are the Son of God, come down. Save yourself and save us. Could he do that? Yes, he could. But if he did that, he would be stepping outside of the limitations that he had imposed upon himself, that the Father also had imposed upon him, and not die as a man. So in order to come down from the cross, in order to call legions of angels to deliver him, he would have to be, he had, would have to use or access his divine power. And of course, that would invalidate the whole purpose of what he had come to do. So he doesn't do those things. He lives as a man. So Jesus is increasing in wisdom and in stature. And uh, the word stature here really means physically. So he is physically growing and becoming a, a strong, young, healthy young man. And in favor with God and men. And so... Notice that he grows in favor with God. Now, again, here's this problem. He is God. How can he grow in favor with God unless he had limited his divine privileges? And so he is growing in his relationship with God. And he is growing in his relationships with people. And remember that Jesus was, was not unpopular until he began to speak the truth in his ministry. When he started speaking the truth, of course, people turned against him. But as a man, he was, he was quite popular. He was, it says that he was growing in favor with people. People liked him. He was a likable young man. 
because he was living a godly life. He was doing the right thing. He, he, he would never say the wrong thing. Uh, he would never do the wrong thing. Uh, and so he is a, a likable uh, member of the society. And so he is growing up. And of course this teaches us about our own spiritual situation, which I've spoken about before, so I'm not going to go there this morning. But I want to speak just for a few moments about the raising of our own children and grandchildren. Our children need to grow in stature. They need to grow physically. I think that we're aware of that, uh, particularly with the health care system. The children are weighed and measured, and we check them to make sure that they make the various milestones, uh, that, they, uh, that they're uh, as heavy as they need to be or as light as they need to be at particular stages as they grow. We're very aware of that. The problem is that sometimes we just allow things just to happen and we don't take responsibility to make sure that our children are growing physically. Just as an example, many children I see in, in uh, the valley that, that grow up, babies that grow up in, in those carriers. And when they should be able to walk, they can't walk. When they should be able to sit up straight, they can't sit up straight because they're, they're lying in the carrier all the time. That, that is not helping the child to grow in stature, to grow physically. We must help our children to grow physically. Sitting in front of television and playing TV games all day does not help them to grow physically. They need to get outside. They need exercise. They need some kind of outlet. So our children need to grow physically. And folk, many of our children don't grow physically because they are not being challenged physically. They are not being challenged to get exercise. And they are not being fed properly. Oh, but our kids are all nice and round and fat. Well, exactly. Because they're eating the wrong stuff. And while they may be overweight, they are malnourished. The stuff that they need for their brains, they're not getting in the candy and the soda. Now, you didn't think you were going to come to church this morning to get a health lesson. But, folks, this is real. If the Bible felt it necessary to say that Jesus grew in stature, that he grew physically, then we and our children need to grow physically. And there's an old saying, which is obviously not in the Bible, but a healthy body is the home of a healthy mind. If your body is not healthy, your mind does not function properly, and your relationship with God and with men is stunted. So our children must be fed correctly. They must get exercise. They must grow in stature. But they must also grow in wisdom. We must develop them intellectually. And again, watching television and playing computer games does not develop them intellectually. They need to be challenged. They need to be stimulated intellectually so that they can grow in wisdom. Not just in the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of God. And the problem is again that we've, we've, we've abdicated our responsibility to the school system and to the church. Oh, the teachers, they can teach him the three R's and um, the church, they can teach him about Jesus. No, it's your responsibility, parents, to train your children, to teach them the things of God. And to make sure that they are learning the stuff they need to be learning at school. Teachers can't handle 40 ch children at a time. They don't have a clue about those children that are slipping through the system. Because they know how to hide in the crowd. But as parents, you need to know whether your child is making the grade. Teachers are not going to flag the children that don't make the grade because it reflects on their teaching ability. Sorry, Angela. It's up to parents to know whether their children are making the grade or not. And if they are not making the grade, to make sure that you give them the assistance they need to be able to make the grade. 
The thing that children are just promoted from one grade to the other when they, when they, they, they don't qualify to, 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 to move on is, is a terrible thing. And a system that produces children with a grade 12 graduation that, that can't read. Folk, we need, to, we need to make sure our kids are not slipping through the system, but that they are growing in wisdom and that they are growing in stature and in favor with God and men. Children need to grow socially. They need to grow socially. And folk, I've, I've, this is the third time I'm mentioning it this morning. But computer games don't teach children social skills. They do, doesn't teach them how to relate to other people. It doesn't teach them how to fit into society. And neither does the television. It's our responsibility as parents to develop our children socially so that they can grow in favor with people. They can get on with people and people can get on with them. And a lot of the crime and a lot of the issues that we have in our society is because people are social misfits. They don't know how to fit into society. They don't know how to relate to other people. And so they resort to crime and to all sorts of other things in order to survive. And ultimately, we need to make sure our children are growing in their relationship with God. It's no good being popular with people, and you can't get on with God, and God doesn't get on with you. That's the responsibility of parents. There's, there's your job. Make sure that your kids are growing in wisdom and knowledge. Make sure that they are growing physically. Make sure that they are growing in their relationship with God and that they are growing in their relationship with people. And it's your job. It's not the psychologist's job. It's not the social worker's job. It's not the church's job. It's not the grandparents' job. It's your job as parents to make sure that your children are increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. So this morning, I hope that you put extra money in the bag because you're going to get two sermons for the price of one. Here's the second one. So we're going to speak about John the Baptist. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius Tetrarch of Abilene. Seven people mentioned in two verses, five secular governors and two spiritual leaders in chapter 3, uh, verse 1 and 2. Now, I, I guess I could bore you for a few Sundays on the history of each one of these characters. We know a lot about them, not, uh, partly, some of it from the scriptures and some of it, some of it from history. Um, I, I don't want to do that. I don't think that that's going to be profitable. I think we need to understand why does Luke mention these five secular leaders and the two spiritual leaders? Well, let's have a look at these men quickly so you have an idea as to who they are. And I know you're going to forget that before we leave here, but that's fine. As long as you get the message. So it's in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. So what Luke is doing is two things. He is giving us a pretty exact date for the beginning of John's ministry and therefore the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But he is also giving us a, in fact he's doing three things. He, he's also giving us the, the context in history. So John is not a mythical figure. He's not some spiritual idea that uh, the uh, gospel writers wrote about. John is a real person and Jesus is real. And so they are being placed in a historical context so that we can understand they, they were not just some kind of, of myth or some kind of idea, but they were real, genuine people. They lived in a particular context. A political context and a spiritual context. 
And then I'm going to come to the third reason why he mentions those once we've gone through these names. And so it's in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar is the Caesar who followed Caesar Augustus. Remember that we saw in chapter 1 that Jesus is born during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus is followed by Tiberius Caesar and he remains Caesar until after the crucifixion of Jesus, until 39. And so he is the only Caesar that we find in the whole of the New Testament other than the birth of, of the Lord Jesus. Pontius Pilate we know about. Pontius Pilate was the one who presided over the botched trial of Jesus. And he is governor of Judea. Pontius Pilate was a vicious man. He was a weakling who covered his weakness with brutality. And in fact, this applies to each one of these five men. The one thing that all five of them have in common is that all five of them are weak and they cover their weakness by brutality. And that's an important lesson for us to learn. Brutality, viciousness, does not equal strength. We can see that Jesus stands before Pilate and you see the two differences. You see a weak man who's trying to show his strength by his viciousness, Pilate. And Jesus' strength is visible in his meekness because his strength is under control. And so Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and I'm not going to analyze these different hierarchies, different regions, and how these all fit, to, fit together. It's not that important for our purposes this morning. Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee. Now, I remember when Jesus was born, it was under Herod the Great. This is not Herod the Great. This is Herod's son. Herod had four sons, and this is one of his sons, and his other son is also mentioned here, Philip. So Herod and Philip are Herod the Great's sons. Herod is a title really more than a name. And so Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea. Of all of these men, Philip apparently was the only half-decent ruler. Um, he wasn't that great, but he was, he was not as bad as the, as the rest of them. And then Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, and we don't know that much about him, but these are the men who are ruling at the time. They are Romans, of course. Not, not all of them are, strictly speaking, Romans, but they are Roman governors, and they are controlling the people of Israel. They're all corrupt, they're all vicious and harsh, and they rule with a rod of iron. And so that's the context in which John and Jesus come on the scene. A dysfunctional political system. If you, if you study the history of these men, there's intrigue and there's murder and they're killing one another. They're killing their own sons in order to protect their positions of power. And folk, while we may not be physically doing that in halls of power in the world today, the same self-centeredness and the same self-serving and the same viciousness and willingness to destroy anything and everyone who opposes one is still prevalent in all areas of politics today from the very lowest levels from our own city council all the way to the White House and so we live in exactly the same kind of environment it's not a, while we have a democracy, they did not have a democracy. But the quality and the, and the state of the, of the rulers is not very different to us. We have certain restraints upon the rulers today. And so they may not kill, they may not uh, do some of the things that these men did physically. But they are of the, same, of the same kind. So we get to the spiritual rulers and there are two. Annas and Caiaphas. And again, those names should be familiar to you because they appear in the trial of the Lord Jesus. Jesus appears before both of these men. And so Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now, I want to spend a little bit more time on these two men. How can there be two high priests? Remember in the Old Testament, there was only one high priest. 
How can there be two high priests? Well, Annas was the old guy. He was Caiaphas's father-in-law. He had been the high priest for a long time, up to about the time of the birth of Jesus. And so he is still called the high priest because he used to be the high priest. The same way as we still speak about American presidents as President Reagan or President uh, Clinton or any of those, those men. The title lives on, even though they're not in the position anymore. Same applies to the governor. We still speak about Governor Schwarzenegger, even though he is not um, the governor at the moment. And so uh, that was the one part of it. But the, the other part of it was that Annas, in fact, was still in power. While he was not officially the high priest anymore, but at this point Caiaphas had been appointed as the high priest, uh, Annas was still the man who was calling the shots. He was still the head of the family. And, and he had, in fact, had appointed, he had four sons also, and for, all four his sons had been priests, high priests, and now finally his son-in-law, the fifth in the dynasty, becomes the high priest. But he is still the one who's pulling the strings. And so while these other men were high priests, they would defer to him all the time, and whatever he said would, would, would go. So really you have two high priests. You have the figurehead, and you have the real power in the form of Annas. These men were not high priests in the true sense of the word. They were not appointed by God, but they were appointed by the Roman government. So they were political stooges, political appointees appointed by the Roman government, and their purpose was to keep the people in check. Their purpose was not to be mediators between the people and God. Remember, that was the purpose of priests in the Old Testament. These men had, that, that was, that really had nothing to do with their job anymore. Their job was to keep the people in line, to keep order amongst the people on behalf of the Roman governor. And so the position would be sold to the highest bidder um, and to the person who could play the political game the best. And that's why Annas was able to survive for such a long time, because he was very shrewd when it came to playing the political game. Now what we're seeing in this here is an alliance between the spiritual leaders and the government. We touched on that very briefly on Thursday night in a different context. Folk, whenever you see an alliance between spiritual leaders and the government, we have a problem. We have that problem right through the Old Testament. We have that problem in the Church of Rome, beginning with Constantine. Remember again, let me remind you, for the first 300 years of the, of the church, the church was persecuted and hated by the government. And the church was pure. And in 300, Constantine came to power and he married the church and the state. And that was the beginning of the Dark Ages, which would happen a thousand years later. That was the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church and all of the, of the nonsense that we've endured for these last thousands and thousands of years when Constantine set himself up as the head of the church. Now, he didn't have that title physically, but he operated in that way. And so very early in the history of the church, Constantine at the Council of Nicaea called the council. It was a council of the bishops to discuss doctrinal issues. But in fact, sitting in the seat of authority and presiding over the, the meetings was Constantine. And Constantine, I don't believe, was even a Christian. He had adopted the Christian faith, possibly even for political reasons. But he was not a true born-again believer. And so we can go on. We can talk about the alliance between Roman uh, popes and governments. And we can talk about the alliance between the reformers and the princes in Germany and in other parts of the world. And we can go on and on and on. And I'm not going to go there. I think that I've upset a few of you already, enough already. You go home and think about that. But Caiaphas and Annas are the high priests. They are corrupt. They are not men of God. They will do anything to protect their position. 
And you remember that it was they who said, it is better that one man die for the people. Now we see that as a, as a, a redemption statement. That Jesus died for us. That was not the way that these men intended it. They, what they intended, what they had in mind was, if Jesus doesn't die, we're going to have trouble. And then the Romans will take over and they will, they will beat us all up and kill us all. So it's better we put Jesus out of the way, kill him because he's the troublemaker and the rest of the nation can get on with living under the Roman oppression. And so they would kill, they, and, and that was the reason they killed Jesus. Well, one of the main reasons they killed Jesus was to protect their position because Jesus had pointed out their corruption and their wickedness. The other problem was that this was a position that gave them not only power but gave them immense wealth. And you remember that we read in the, um, in, in the, uh, the crucifixion story and the trial of the Lord Jesus where it speaks about the uh, palace of Caiaphas and the palace of, of Annas. They literally lived in palaces. They took a cut out of every sacrifice that was brought to the temple. You could not bring a sacrifice in the temple that had not been approved by the high priest. And in order for the high priest to approve the sacrifice, he had to get his share of that. You, so a certain amount of the money was paid directly to the high priest in order for the sacrifice to be approved. On top of that, you remember Jesus got rid of the money changes. One of the rules that they had imposed is that the temple tax that every Jew had to pay had to be paid in local currency. And so if you came from another part of the world, which many of them did, you remember there were people from all over the world coming to the feasts, they would come with a currency from the country that they came from. But they couldn't pay the temple tax, so they would have to exchange that for local, local currency. And they would do that in the temple. Those money exchanges also paid a commission to Annas and to Caiaphas. And obviously if they didn't pay their commission, if they didn't pay, didn't pay their share, they would get kicked out and they couldn't operate as money changers. And so the sacrifices, the money that was brought to the temple for the priests, they would get a share of that. And so there was not an area of the life of the common Jew that they did not take a part of the a part of the money and so it was a position that had tremendous power and that had a lot of money uh, attached to it and this becomes the basis of the spiritual leaders now I don't have to tell you that we find ourselves in a very similar place today that many people are in spiritual leadership because of power and money those two things. Christian church is good money these days. Unless you preach the message we preach, there's no money in that. There's no money in the truth. So we, we have the same situation. We have a political system that's really not helping the true faith. We have spiritual leadership that is really just trying to enrich themselves at the expense of the people. And it's in this situation that John and Jesus come. And this is not new. You remember that Samuel, the little boy, young boy who grew up in the temple, that it says of that time, it says that the word of God was rare or scarce in those days. And there was no open vision. The priesthood had become corrupt. And even Eli, his mentor, who was probably the best man spiritually in Israel at the time, he didn't even understand the voice of God. When God calls Samuel, Eli doesn't recognize, in fact, this is God calling and of course, Eli had his corrupt sons, you remember, and, and he turns a blind eye to them. So, so Eli, the high priest at that time, was also an nepotist. He had put his sons in power, just like, like Annas had put his sons in power. 
because of the money that was attached to it. And you remember that Eli's sons did exactly what Annas and Caiaphas are doing, and that is that anybody who brought a sacrifice to the temple, they would first take their cut and then offer the rest to God. So you can see the parallels. The, the king is corrupt at, that, at, the, at the time of, um, of Annas and Caiaphas. And so it is in that situation that Samuel comes, and he is a true prophet of God. It's in the same situation that John comes and then later Jesus comes with the word of God. Now you'll see then, let's move on to the last part of this verse. And the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Now when it says the word of God came to him, it doesn't mean that God gave him scripture. Uh, John did not write any scripture. John had a very particular job and function, but he did, was not one of the gospel writers, and he did not write any of the epistles or any of the Old Testament books. But when it says the word of God came to him, it's, it's, it's almost the same, and we, we, we're going to hear about uh, uh, Moses in the next few weeks, how that God speaks to Moses in the wilderness. Where's John? In the wilderness. And says to Moses, you need to go and set the people free. And so it's just God speaking in whichever way he did at the time, whether it was a voice. In Moses' case, it was a voice. In the case of John, we don't know if it was a voice or it was just an impression he has in his heart, just knowing this is now the time, this is what I need to do. But somehow God gets his message through to him. And remember that God still speaks in that way to us. God does not speak beyond his word. He doesn't add to his word. But he still directs us through his spirit. And he is still giving us direction. He's saying, do this, do that, don't do that. And of course the problem is that mostly we don't hear his voice. And when we do hear his voice, we don't obey his voice. But it doesn't mean that he is not still directing us. And we, uh, John, Paul calls this being led by the spirit. Being led by the Spirit is not some kind of airy-fairy thing that, you know, or a Ouija board that has become very popular among some Christians today. So if you want to know the will of God, we play the, 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 the Ouija board. God help us. God does not speak through demonic stuff. But God does speak to us by His Spirit. And we know His voice. We, when he speaks, but unfortunately we don't, we don't want to know his voice a lot of the time. But John hears the voice. God speaks to him. And God speaks to him in the wilderness. I've made mention of Moses. Later on we'll see Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days before he is commissioned. And he goes out and begins his ministry. Why is he in the wilderness? Well, I don't know that John is being tested, but I think that John is in the wilderness because he is isolated from the religious world and the political world at the time. When it speaks about the wilderness here, this, this is really a, a rough place. Some here have been to Israel. I haven't been, but I, I've read a little bit about it. And as I understand it, in fact, the one commentator that I read some time ago said that if you imagine Death Valley, if you've ever been to Death Valley uh, here in California, uh, this wilderness, this desert is ten times worse than Death Valley. Now, I, I can't imagine that. Death Valley is bad enough. But that's the kind of environment. This is where the, um, the uh, Qumran um, uh, Death, Dead Sea Scrolls are found. And there are some communities in that area at this, at this time. Some people say John was part of one of those communities. There's no evidence for that. But John is living away from Jerusalem, away from the spiritual and political center of activity. He is out there, just him and God. And folk, I think that there's a lesson in that for us. Now, this isn't where I'm going to ask you to sell your house and buy a trailer so we can go live in the desert. But we need to live spiritually uncontaminated by the world. That's the point. 
And some people need to do that by physically going to live in the desert, I guess. But even if we're in the world, we're not of the world. And we cannot allow our spiritual views to be shaped by the corrupt spiritual system in which we find ourselves in the world today, or by the political system. And I'm not going to get into specifics on that this morning, I'll spare you. But he's in the wilderness. It's just him and God. That's really what it's about. Folk, we need to get alone with God. We need to get away from the television and it's constantly shaping our thinking and our values and we need to get with God. And maybe you can't get into the desert but you can certainly turn the television and the cell phone off. But we need to get alone with God. We need to allow God to shape our thinking and not the world to shape our thinking. We need to hear His voice and not the voice of everybody else around us. And so it's in this terrible dark hour that John hears the Word of God. And folk, we find ourselves in a very similar situation. And God is still speaking. He is still calling us. He is still sending us. But we need to hear His voice. And you're not going to hear His voice while the media is blaring in your ears. You're not going to hear his voice unless you get quiet before God. And while we may not be able to do that physically, we must do it spiritually. We must shut ourselves off and get with God and allow God to speak to us. Because if we're going to be of any value to God, we need to hear from him first. And as we're going to see with Moses as he spends that 40 years in the wilderness. And, and I, I don't want to pre... I want to, don't want to steal Henry's thunder. But why is Moses in the wilderness for 40 years? Why so long? Because it took God 40 years to get Egypt out of Moses. To get Egypt, Egypt's thinking, Egypt's values, Egypt's way of doing things out of Moses and for Moses to begin to think like God does. And here's John. We don't know how long he'd been in the wilderness. It may have been 10 years, 20 years from, from, from a young age, possibly. I don't know. But he's clearly living in the wilderness. And he's being shaped by God. May God shape our thinking. May God shape our values. And folk, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this because I am horrified by how few Christians think God's way. Their thinking has been shaped by social media, has been shaped by the political system of this world, has been shaped by the religious system of this world, and is not being shaped by the Word of God. And it's not being shaped by God Himself. Let me give you one example. Right now the social media is just filled with images of children being aborted at late full term. And of course it's terrible. And so all the Christians are shouting about New York and New York's rules and laws and, and the corruption and, and everything else that goes on. But a month ago they were silent about babies who were fetuses that were being aborted at one month, two months, three months. What's the difference? There is no difference between a baby being aborted at full term and being aborted after a week. There's no difference whatsoever. It's still alive. It makes no difference. But why are the Christians all up in arms? Because the media has told them to, 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 to get all loud about it now. If you're going to be loud about what's happened in New York now, you should have been loud about it all along. Amen. 
But you see, we're being shaped by the media. The media is telling us, Facebook is telling us what to think and what to do and how to react. And if you're angry about a full-term abortion, you should be just as angry about a one-week abortion. Because there is no difference. It's a life. But we get angry about the one and not angry about the other one. Because we've been conditioned and shaped by the world. This is just one example, and I can go on and on and on with many countless examples of how the church's views are being manipulated by political forces today. The only way you will see things God's way is if you shut out the world and you allow God to speak to you through His Word and through His Spirit. The Word of God came to John in the wilderness. Are you hearing the voice of God? Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of these men. John, Lord, who is willing to lay aside the comforts of living in the city. The acclaim that may have come from being part of the system. And was willing to become your man. The greatest of all the prophets. Lord, I pray that you would help us today, that we may be your people, hearing your voice, feeling your heart, expressing your values, and not what everybody else is telling us to do or to say. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, help us to raise our kids, Lord, that they may become physically, emotionally, and spiritually strong, and socially adept. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us. We live in evil times. We live in a wicked world. And Lord, it's becoming more and more wicked as wickedness has put on more and more of a facade of re religion and of religiosity. But Lord, we pray that we may get down to the real brass tacks, the real issues with you and your word. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, our hearts continue to go out to those who are not here and those who are struggling today, Lord, we pray that you would minister to them. Go with us now, Lord. Keep us and protect us and bring us together again safely on Thursday. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.